James Atkins, the irrigation engineer for the University of Delaware. We're at the Warrington Irrigation Research Farm and at the subsurface study that was just started in 2012 with a 42 zone subsurface drip irrigation research. So there's an emitter and there's an emitter. The water just bubbles out, drips, runs down the tube. This tape is buried 16 inches down, five foot apart, and strips lengthwise of this field. So it's running parallel with this road. Okay. There's 29 and a half miles of drip tape buried in this 18 acres. All that drip tape manually connected to a connector just like this. And these pipes all go four feet down to a piece of PVC that runs all the way across the field. There's 14 pieces of PVC running that way. Each one of these are drilled by hand. These connections made to each piece of drip tape across the field. This system is probably 20 times more complicated than anything you would have in a normal scenario. This is built for research, so it's divided up into zones. Normally this field would only have one, maybe two zones for everything. So you would have a header line on one side where all the water comes in this pipe and it goes to a flush line that would be on the other end. We have to have a flush line because any precipitates or sediment or anything that lands in that tape, we need to be able to flush them out. Unlike a vegetable crop where we're going to dispose of the tape on a yearly basis, we can't afford to plug these nozzles up because we want them to last 15 to 20 years. So we've got a flush line that's on the end of each zone. We can open valves just like these. The water will run out. we got enough velocity to blow any sediment out of that drip tape and run it back out here on the ground. So right here, we've got a main line coming from the pump up at the building that runs right straight to the woods. We've got three manifolds. This manifold, this is an air vent that lets any air that's contrapped in the line out. Supplies each one of these 14 valves and all 14 of these plates go straight towards the woods. You can actually see a little line here. That's where there's not any water coming out because it's hooked into the pipes. So the, the outside two pipes only run in 60 feet. That one will be connected to the 60 foot of, of tape on this side. This one here, to the 60 foot of tape on that side. And then after that, we connect to this pipe and that pipe. So you're seeing it go from 14 to 12 to 10. And by the time we get to the end, we've only got two pipes. So it's feeding both ways and each individual zone. So we're looking at seven zones on this side, seven zones on this side. The manifolds on either side of me, feed going the other way. There are seven zones on that block, seven zones in this block, seven zones here, and seven zones here for a total of 42 separate zones. So we can put any combination of irrigation on any one of these zones. This field, much like the other field, is divided up into five soil classifications, ranking from driest to wettest and the plot's randomized within that. Um, first thing for all those, I'm assuming most everybody here is irrigating soybeans with a center pivot. If you've got this, irrigating or, or in hard hose, okay. If you've got this, first thing to learn is take everything you know about subsurface or about center pivot irrigation and throw it out the window because it does not apply any longer. I like to mess up bad at the beginning of the season. We were using the same treatments we were over there to trigger irrigation based on soil moisture sensors. Started getting to our triggers at about 30 centibars and 40 centibars, started turning water on. We ran three to four tenths of an inch of water every day and could not get it wet. It was continuing to dry out. What that told us right off, we started four days too late. This system will maintain moisture in your profile. It will not replace it. So once you've got the water there, it'll keep it there, but you can't let it go. So what we saw was my corn was continuing to suffer from heat and drought stress, started to curl, did that for two days, and I got an inch and a tenth of rain. Bailed me out of a jam, we took that plan, we threw it away, and we come up with a new plan. One of these treatments out here gets a daily irrigation replacement. So we calculate how much water and predict how much water that crop used today. Tomorrow, the same amount will be applied. So I'm replacing what was used the day before. So if today we use two tenths of an inch, I'll apply two tenths of an inch tomorrow. That happens every day. You get a rainfall, it zeroes you back out. You use two tenths the next day, and I come back to we lay out one day after a rain, and then we go back replacing the previous day's water. Okay? We're going to pump a lot more water with this system than you will with center pivot. And I, I take that back. I'm not going to say a lot more. You will pump more unless you get a wet spring. Because crop emergence, 
crop establishment and herbicide activation are some real challenges behind this. When you're applying water 16 inches down, <coughs> you've got to get a crop up that's only, what, inch and three quarters down? That, in a sandy soil, that water will not move up. Rephrase that. It will move up, but you're going to pump significantly large amount of water down to get it to move up. So for every inch I pump, I may get two tenths to go up, but I'm losing eight tenths down. So I lose so much on the front end trying to wet that profile that even though we're more efficient on the tail end, we never recover that efficiency. Now, if you've got a clay soil or high organic matter soil or something with a very impervious layer underneath the tape, that doesn't necessarily apply. We can tell a huge difference over here. When we put these trenches in going that way, the sand was five foot deep, solid sand. Not a clay layer, not a compaction layer, not anything, it's just sand. And when we irrigate three to four tenths a day, it gets behind every single day until we get a rain which catches us back up. But we're steadily getting behind. The opposite happens over here. We get more clay the closer we get to that woods. The treatments are treated the same as the sand and they stay wet all the time because it wicks it right up to the top. That, that capillary action of that clay will pull that moisture up there. So there's a huge difference in soil and one of the things, if you're going to design a system, you need to consider doing your zones based on soil type rather than geography. Because if it was up to me, I would irrigate quite a bit more water or be pulsing my applications on the sandy soil and be putting less over here because I'm getting a better utilization over here in this way. Um, Study-wise, uh, anybody notice this little spot here where, where the beans are about half the height everywhere else? And notice how it goes all the way across the field and you can see how the corn is doing the same thing? And guess what that is? It was a brood there. And it's been a field since 1936. According to the aerial image, there wasn't a road there in 1936. We show up every bit of compaction or anything that was changed in that field will show up with this because of how it affects that water moving up. You see along the road here, you see how there's some corn that is low? We had to haul some dirt out of a dirt hole back here. Any place where there was a water hole and he pulled out the field to go around the water hole, it has showed up. Even though it's been run over with a ripper twice and then had the tape laid in it, it still shows right up that compaction. So it will really show the problem spots in your field up. This field, field has been neglected for probably the past 20 years because it never yielded anything. It was so sandy we could get 50, 60 bushel of corn on a good year. Um, so we kind of neglected it fertility-wise, and we're, show, we're seeing it. Now that we got some water out here, it shows up big time. Um, if you look at the corn, this first block here of 60 foot, you see there's a little squirrely looking gap in here. This is where we're adjusting our GPS. We're looking at planting, straddling the tape, versus one row drape on top of the tape and one row 30 inches from the tape, and then offset by seven and a half inches. To see if it does require you to plant back with the RTK map back on top of the tape, or you can just plant it random. So we want to quantify if there's any yield drag there. On the other side of the corn, when we leave, you can see there's some double crop beans over there. They've been planted twice. The first time, it was very dry. The irrigation had not been run prior Planted them, turned the water on, pumped about four tenths every day for a week. I got a nice little strip of beans about this wide that came up, and the four feet in between each piece of tape did not come up. Got a rain, by that point in time, nothing came up worth a darn. Dissed them up, waited for it to rain, planted them, got them up, and now we're able to keep up with them. So that crop establishment period is going to be a big deal. If you're growing wheat, <coughs> You know how when it starts to mature, you're going to turn the water off. You're not going to do that here. Because when you go to plant your double crop beans, it's going to be rock solid and you'll not get it back wet. You're going to have to pump water that whole period where you're drying that wheat and small grain down. And you've got something to plant that double crop beans and you get it. Other challenges, wireworms can eat holes in this stuff. There's nothing labeled to shoot through it. Groundhogs can bud a hole in it. They're searching for water. Foxes are searching for water. So you need a very good um, uh, varmint management program. Um, and when you've got a leak in a pivot, you can look across the field and find it. you got a leak in that corn, you're either going to walk the corn or you're going to find it with the combine. Other thing to consider is how you're going to tear this up. 
Um, some of your tillage practices, we've cut the tape disc in twice, two places, and it's 16 inches down because it's not always 16 inches. That moves a little bit. So we've managed to have to do two repairs due to tillage processes already. Um, if you harvest when it's wet and you cut a rut, it's really not a big deal to cut it in 16 inch trench. That wouldn't even hardly get you stuck. You're gonna tear that tape up. The big challenge there isn't for grain crops because we can usually wait if we have to, but on vegetable crops like sweet corn or peas and lima beans, where if they need picking and it rains eight inches the night before, they're gonna pick them anyway, this stuff isn't gonna to work too good. So although this gives us a lot of options for some irregular shaped fields, it gives us some options where we don't have a lot of water, uh, simply because you're not going to be, you don't have to generate a lot of pressure. If you kind of zone, divide it up the way you need to. Um, it's not a magic bullet. We're not going to start replacing pivots with this. But it does give us the capability of putting some irrigation online. Nice thing is, neighbors never know when you're pumping water. So you don't have that neighbor issue going on. Um, but there are, there are a host of challenges to go with it. We're learning a lot this year. Um, you can definitely see, if you look across here, you see how there's a dip and then there's a high spot, a dip and a high spot in the beans. The high spot's where the tape is, the dip is where in that in between the tape. How far can you run this through? You can run about 1,100 feet on one run of tape before you start to have a problem. So like in this field, this farm is right on 1,000 foot long. We could do a header line on one end and a flush line on the other. If it was any longer, we'd have to run a header line through the center and feed it out from the middle and then do the flush lines on either end because you start to get a pretty big pressure drop when you get past 1,100 feet. Yes, sir. Did you, I didn't, I'm not sure if I heard it. Did you talk about how you can spoon feed, you know what I mean, just like we do with watermelons? Uh, well, and, it, and, and that's a good question, Kevin. And he's talking about doing fertigation through this system. And we have shot fertilizer through this system. But one of my concerns is we're putting fertilizer down 16 inches. And we know we're losing some water through the profile. So you, natural assumption is we're going to push that fertilizer with it. So that's one of the things I aim to see is, is that a good idea? So I was looking at it because we got one, we're, we're banking on the roots are, are going to that water. So if it's coming out of the tape, it's going to be ready and available. And I, and I understand as far as leaching, but I'm, I'm hoping that that plant's taking it up as, as long as you're putting a sl, you know, small amount at a time, it's, it's pulling it back up as quickly as you're putting it out. The, the, the trick is to make sure that you're not irrigating, over irrigating. And, and that's, that's a big question. I think in most cases, at least here, uh, we are airing on the side to over irrigate. And at this point in time, that's probably going to be my recommendation is if without a better way to look at it right now and not a lot of data to air on the side of over irrigate. Because when we've got a tape area right here and we're saturating this area, we can still get the advantage of oxygen to the roots because there's a dry strike next to it. Whereas if we saturate the whole area with a pivot, we can start seeing some drowning out problems we can start to see in some uh, disease problems too. Some disease problems and everything else but we don't see that as much here so there's a potential here to push a little more water without having a detrimental effect but what does that do on fertigation and that's one of the things we want to find out we don't know the answer to that